Okay, we are recording. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to keep this simple, short, maybe depending on, on how many follow up questions you have. The last couple times um, when we have met here on these Tuesdays, uh, we were talking about how to evaluate and, and um, the analysis of any particular investment transaction that is forthcoming. We're gonna be kind of digging into, we did a little bit of, of back and forth on that regard. Uh, I don't know if it was, I think it was the week before last, okay. um, but Larry and I are gonna be together when we, we come back and, and really get into that. So for today, I wanted to share with you guys um, kind of a segue into uh, a new second lien HELOC that we are now going to be offering to our investors, something that we have not had, admit all. Something that we have not had or offered, God, since before 0809, second lien HELOCs for investment transactions, investment properties specifically, have just not been um, on the menu of loan products that Ridge offers, and we're pretty diverse, but that's just not been something that we've had. We do have it now literally in the last 48 hours, so I've got some details about that that I can share, but as it relates to that, I thought that today, unless you guys have any other um, uh, topics that you want me to dig into, I was going to talk about ways to invest without lots of capital or access to lots of capital. There's a few different things that, um, uh, and, and I have these conversations quite often where investors will call or they'll come in and say, I really want to get into real estate, but I don't have a lot of capital to invest. So I thought I would take that and just kind of go through a few of the different alternatives that you can be looking for, looking at, and then once we get through that, we can talk about the, the second lien HELOC too and what those approximate terms will look like. So, um, and if you guys have questions, as always, put them in the chat. I'm going to try to be looking at that and for that as we're in fact, why don't I get that over to the side so I can see anything come over? Yeah, people are still coming in. Admit. Um, so yeah, if you've got questions, throw them in that chat and I'll, I'll answer them before we wrap for today. So um, ways to invest without capital. I'm just going to kind of go through my list and then we can we can uh, uh, look through or dig a little bit deeper on each of them. So home equity, obviously, is the first place I tell people to look, uh, whether a primary residence or an investment property. Oh, sorry, guys. I told you I'm, I'm the one controlling this. There's more people in the waiting room. Hold on. Joining. Um, so home equity. Do you have equity in any one of your properties that you want to tap into, whether by just a straight cash out refinance and or a second lien HELOC. Um, that's the first place to look. A lot of people have retirement accounts too, that they, they don't realize that they may have access to liquidate. That might be another place that they can be looking for capital if they want to get into real estate investing. Um, there are additional ways in which you can leverage unsecured lines of credit. We've talked about this a few times in the community over the, the weeks and months, but an unsecured line of credit could be uh, every bit as, as, as ordinary as a credit card. There are companies out there, Seed Capital also, I think I've mentioned on our, our time here on our, our Tuesday meetings, um, Seed Capital is a company and there's, there's probably dozens of them out there that will allow you to go out if you qualify and get these unsecured lines of credit at 20 or 25,000 a piece, maybe you qualify for five of these. And in which case you've got roughly $100,000 or $125,000 of this capital. And a lot of times they can find for qualified individuals, these lines of credit that are zero interest for six months or 12 months or even 18 months, where you can leverage against these, against these unsecured lines of credit as a means of either down payment, now there's a caveat to that in a second, or you could leverage the entire unsecured line of credit or the entire T of the lines of credit that you have to acquire a property for cash, right? Where you're using these lines of credit to pay cash for a property and then turn around and do a cash out refinance using conventional or fixed rate terms where you pay back a portion or all of the, the line that you drew from. That would be a, a really, um, kind of uh, more sophisticated strategy that investors can um, apply when they're out there and they don't have a ton of, of their own capital. I can answer specific questions about that. We'll come back to it in a minute. And then the other thing that you can look at is a JV. And I'm seeing this more and more actually with um, 
younger folks where they don't necessarily have a lot of their own capital, but they have good credit and they've got, you know, stable W-2 jobs. So their debt to income ratio and everything works. So they go out there and find a joint venture, somebody else that has the capital, but maybe this individual doesn't have the credit or the income to qualify on their own. So they join forces and that would be another way that you could get, get going into real estate investing. Um, do any one of those, those topics, um, do, do you guys have any questions or any one of those you want me to dig further into? I'll take a minute and talk more about the unsecured lines of credit. But beyond that, I would just get into our new second lien HELOC that we're, we have available now for investments. Anybody? Just throw them in the chat or unmute yourself and, and I'll just take your questions. For those of you that are just joining us, I'm solo today, guys. Larry is on vacation until Thursday, so um, I'm, I'm running this one myself. Um, I did remember, for those that know me well enough to know this is funny, I did remember to hit the record button. That's, a, that's, that's big for me. Yeah. Um, okay. Question, Charlie. Yes. Um, would you be willing to talk about uh, the quality of the investments that are being offered through um, Keith Weinhold and, um, you know, and how good, you know, maybe would you, would you recommend or not recommend those turnkey type of products? Um, I, and I don't, and if, if you'd rather not Give an opinion. That's fine. I understand, but um, you know, uh, if you if you would give an opinion, that would be great too. Sure. So, I mean, I, I, it would be great if we had an example property. And if if this is Michael, right? Yes. Okay. So, if we had an example property, I think taking that and kind of um, peeling it back and looking at it from you know an, an up here perspective, I can do that. But uh, I can tell you from what I see, what comes across my desk that I know they're from the turnkeys that Keith promotes on his website, um, they're, strong, um, they're strong returns. I have not, at, at least from my perspective, nothing that's come across my desk, I've not had any complaints or anybody come back and say, you know, this property that was purchased from um, a Keith Weinhold referral didn't work out, property management sucked, the return wasn't what they said, the rents are lower than they said, None of that has come across my desk. So from that just by itself, I would assume that, that they're, they're pretty solid. Um, but if you have any examples, Michael, that might be a, a good way just to kind of take a look. And I can tell you based on that and what I'm seeing from other markets and, and other investments that we are funding on, maybe how they stack up if you've got something. Um, I haven't picked one out for today, but uh, perhaps I could bring one for next week's call, if that sure. would be possible. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's going to be something else that um, I, I started for those of you that are just joining us. Um, uh, not last week, but the week before we started to dig into how to analyze a return. Um, and we got into a few of the different benchmarks and what to look for. When Larry is, is back, we're really going to do a deep dive into rate of return, cash on cash return. What are the differences? Uh, and we can, Michael, if you're going to be here or if you're here and you have a property, uh, we can use that as our beta test. And, and maybe you and I can talk in advance and take a look at it or others and see, maybe get one that works and one that doesn't. And we have a comparison that might be useful for people to, to look at. Yes, I would greatly appreciate that. Um, okay. I, every, I, I've been meaning to join these calls more often. Uh, this is my first one. It just seems like, unfortunately, in the last, <laughs> I've had other commitments on this time slot except for today, but I'm going to try to make a point to uh, join these calls. Thank you. Welcome. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. Um, and Michael, I might um, just, um, I don't know if this was really the question you were asking, but I'm working with a JWB right now to purchase two properties. Um, through my husband's 401k plan. So it's, it's um, non-recourse loan. So it's more expensive. So the, the um, ROI doesn't really, but anyway, the, um, the company has been, I'm in the middle of it right now and they have been wonderful. So I couldn't, couldn't say enough good things about how, um, cause I've had some experiences with other um, providers and um, they have just been top notch. Yes, thank you. They're, they're, they're definitely on my short list. Great. Uh, I will maybe bring a property next week. I don't want to take Jaylee's thunder here for right now. This is her, her meeting. <laughs> 
No, that's that's this is this is an open forum, you guys. No problem at all. Thank you, Donna, for that feedback. That's that's Thank helpful. You, um, I can also say, guys, that I believe I believe in most cases, maybe not exclusively, but in most cases, the properties that Keith are, that are on his website that he promotes those turnkeys. I believe he owns properties and has purchased properties as well from them. So that that probably tells you quite a bit about the validity of the the investment and the return. Um, the other thing I would say about that is that, and we talked about this uh, last week or the week before, that we need to be changing our expectation a little bit when we talk about what the returns should be. Um, if we are expecting the returns that we we saw or were receiving in the last 12 or 24 months, um, that's not where your your benchmark should be anymore. That's That's no longer the case. It's not valid. Uh, but there's other compensating factors that you also need to be layering in, in addition to just the cash flow, because the cash flow is primarily going to be what's what we've noticed has changed in this this last eight, six, eight months, um, 2022, um, and really focusing on some of the other priority benefits of real estate investing, since we are losing a little bit in the cash flow. Um, but we'll we'll be digging into that when Larry gets back, um, probably next week. So, uh, Michael, if you want to kind of check in with me offline, just email me, cridge at ridgelandgroup.com, and let's start the discussion, and we'll be ready for, for uh, next week in a, a beta test property if you've got one. Thank you. Um, okay, so let me just, I'm going to recap on that unsecured line of credit thing uh, for those of you that are interested in, you know, other people's money as a means of acquiring investment property. There's Miss Nancy. Let's let her in. Um, so if you're using this as a means for a down payment, okay, like you're 20% down or you're 25% down, please keep in mind that most guidelines are going to require that the down payment be sourced and seasoned funds on investment transactions, borrowed funds or gift funds are not allowed as the down payment. So if you're getting an unsecured line of credit and you're going to draw down 20,000 or 40,000, whatever your down payment is. Um, you need to take those monies, stick it into an account that you're going to show for your, your, your cash to close. Let it sit there for two months to where when we get the statements, we no longer see the deposit. We only see the balance. Because remember, if I see a deposit that we consider a large deposit as defined by anything over 50% of your income, we're going to question it and say, okay, Michael, where did that deposit come from? If you said, well, I have a line of credit here that I, I drew from and I deposited it, those then would be considered borrowed funds for a down payment and you cannot use them. Um, if you liquidated some stock or you got a big commission check or a tax refund, those are all seasoned funds. Those are your funds and that large deposit would be perfectly acceptable. If it's something that we cannot trace as having originated with you, any large deposit will not be allowed. So in this case, an unsecured line of credit that you're going to be drawing from, those would be considered borrowed funds. So they must be taken out, set in an account, leave it there until you can give me two months worth of bank statements so I don't see that uh, that large deposit in there. And then, mm -hmm. yes. So if you have an existing HELOC that's just sitting there that you, I can draw on at any time, is that do I have to draw on that and let, let that sit into my savings account for two months? Good question. Um, absolutely not. Those are source and season funds. And the difference between that and what I'm talking about is unsecured, which is what I'm talking about, versus secured. Michael, your HELOC is secured against real property that you own. And that equity, if you've got it in the form of a HELOC, is liquid and fully seasoned. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Can I throw another question here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I uh, took an idle loan for my LLC that I was, I got approved for, uh, for about $260,000 that I use in my other land, my other real estate business. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't really used it yet. It's sitting over in my LLC, um, but it is probably would be considered a personal loan because I personally guaranteed it, I guess, would it show up on my credit report? It might. Uh, I'd have to see. Uh, I'd have to see the 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 term of the loan, and it's it's unsecured to your LLC, or is it attached to a property? 
It's an idle loan from the government. So it's, I guess it's unsecured. I guess. I'm what are you calling it? An idle? What are you calling it? A what loan? And, and uh, the uh, idle E I D L loan. The um, oh 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 okay like from 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 the when the government was giving out free money. Got it. E I E I D L loan. Got it. So yeah, those would not be considered source and season funds if you were to draw from that and then stick it in an account, let it season, then we could use it. Keeping in mind that drawing on something like that, that's going to generate a payment, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if there's going to be, that's going to be part of a debt to income ratio uh, calculation as well. So if you borrowed $50,000 and the payment was 500 bucks a month, just keep in mind that that $500 is going to be part of the debt to income ratio when we calculate that after the 50,000 had been uh, deposited right. and sourced and seasoned. This idle loan is meant for uh, business purposes in the form of inventory, paying, you can you know, pay whatever, you know, the whole idea is to government assistance to help out during the COVID period and get companies back on their feet. I was told that I qualified. I followed the proper paperwork and, did, and answered truthfully to all the questions and they approved me. Uh, so I have this money that I can use for quote inventory. Um, and, um, but again, I think it was, I did have to sign, I think I had to personally guarantee the funds. It's a 30 year fixed term for a 3.75. Uh, so, and they don't have to pay, pay back any part of the loan for two years. Um, I, so I'm, I guess the core of my question is with such a large debt, would you think that would disqualify me from any further debt that I could that I, I could go after for you know to buy a house with? So if you let's say for example uh, what you're saying, Michael, is if you leverage the entire two hundred thousand at three point seven five over a thirty year amortization, whatever the principal and interest payment of that is, um, and if we were to take all of that, put it into the debt column, and then cal recalculate the debt to income ratio, the answer is it's really gonna depend on what your other monthly liabilities are against what your monthly income is. And keep in mind, based on some variables that I don't have at, at this time, um, any new acquisition of real estate is going to have income associated to help offset that liability. So the, the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, I if, understand. Right, so if you, let's just say we have $10,000 a month of income for you. And that the liability on this two hundred thousand dollars is going to be fifteen hundred bucks. I don't know. And the rest of your monthly obligations that I have to count, which really only exist on your credit report, not including some mortgages and things, but those usually have income to offset. But just your baseline monthly liability on your credit report, let's say, is another three thousand dollars. Okay, so three thousand dollars of of monthly expenses that I have to hit you for fifteen hundred dollars on this this um, idle loan. That's forty five hundred. You make ten thousand dollars a month. Chances are you would qualify, right? You're underneath that fifty percent threshold based on the easy math numbers I'm throwing out there. So those variables need to be checked, and then I could we could do a back of the napkin uh, when we connect offline here. I can certainly take you through that real quickly and ask some pointed questions and tell you approximately where I think you land. Very good. I, uh, I understand it's complicated. I won't uh, distract any further. Nope, no, 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 please. Ed, that, I mean, that's what we're here for. The, the Q&A. I like it, actually. Um, OK, so I think I went through. So the unsecured lines of credit that I, I just went over when we're talking about a down payment, when you're drawing for 20 percent down or 25 percent down, those need to be sourced and seasoned funds. There is a flip to that coin that makes that statement sourced and seasoned untrue if you're going to be drawing the entire lines of the the entirety of the lines of credit and utilizing the sum of it for a, an acquisition where you're kind of paying cash for that property. Those don't have to be sourced and seasoned funds because what's happening is is that let me let me throw out the example. So you've got hundred thousand dollars in lines of credit. You've got four lines of credit at twenty five thousand a piece. You draw all of it down. You got hundred thousand dollars of access at at your fingertips, and it's a zero interest for six months. OK, so you take that and you go out and you buy an investment property for one hundred thousand dollars. And when we get to do a cash out refinance of that property, because you're now the owner, let's just say that the value came in at one hundred and thirty thousand. OK, seventy five percent is what the maximum loan to value is. Seventy five percent of one thirty is ninety seven thousand five hundred. That's going to be the loan that we are going to secure for you. 
let's say closing costs are five grand. So 97.5 minus 5,000, we're at 92.5. So that 92,500 is gonna be used to repay that much of the 100 grand that you leveraged, all right? The difference between the 92.5 and the 100,000 that you've taken is 7,500, right? Am I doing my mental math right? So that's what's going to be left on those lines of credit that you will be obligated to repay and will be part of the debt to income ratio calculation we're going to be using to qualify you. So we're paying off, uh, in our case, 92.5% of what you borrowed. And then you've got that leftover that a lot of times what will happen is, is that in addition to it being part of your debt to income ratio, whatever the minimum calculation payment is, the individual investor is just going to use simply the cash flow of the rental properties to repay. Uh, let's see. This is this is where my technology starts to fail me. There it is, mute all. Okay, sorry guys. I, I found the mute all button. I didn't mute me though. No, it didn't. Okay. Um, that sounded like a cute little squealer though. I don't know who that was, but I love it. So um, makes sense. So based on that example, debt to income ratio is going to have to carry whatever minimum payment would be left on the uh, 7,500 and the repayment of the unsecured lines of credit within that cash out refinance, whatever proceeds are left after closing costs are covered will go to repay that debt. And then you're going to use your passive income, the, the net cash flow of that rental property, probably to repay the 7,500 until it's paid to zero. Obviously, the sooner you can pay it back, the better, because you've got this zero interest on that, that money for only a, a specific period of time. Free money, why not? And then you pay that off. And then what happens is, is that those lines of credit have been replenished. You've paid them back depending on how long you have that zero interest for, you can continue to rinse and repeat. That might be another way. It's, it's the Burr strategy for those of you that are familiar with that. That's one way that investors who don't have a lot of their own capital can get into the game and, and acquire investment property with very little skin in the game if the numbers of the property are sufficient enough in value and, and et cetera. Um, any questions about that? I know it's kind of a, a, a complicated topic. Uh, Miss Marta says, would you, uh, you would to count his current housing expense? Um, I don't know what you mean. Will you unmute yourself what you're saying there? I don't know if it's typed wrong. Or maybe I just missed the, the detail before what I was saying. No, I was just asking when Michael was asking you if he would qualify. You were running the math. I just wanted to make sure that you were including his housing expense in those numbers. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Um, that's that's everybody. For those of you that are not aware, you you have a little bit of a treat. Marta Wycombe is on the call. She is um, she's the brains of of Ridge Lending. So we have a celebrity um, guest star with us. If you have any real specific underwriting questions, she's here. Let's ask them because she will make sure that I get it right. Um, Amy's asking, can you do Burr method on commercial real estate? I don't see why not. You just have to make sure, Amy, that the numbers are, are within range of what you're trying to do, which really boils down to what the ARV is going to be, that after repair value. If you're doing Burr, you're buying it for X, maybe putting Y into it, and you're expecting Z as the ARV. So that ARV is really the linchpin that you want to be paying close attention to and that it is within, you know, small small variant for error within range of what you're expecting. If you think that the ARV is going to be 100000 and it comes in at 70000 obviously that could be a, a big problem. So um, make sure that you're getting as much data from as many different resources as possible so that you've, you've got, you're relatively secure in what that, that end after repair or appraised value is gonna be. Um, okay, so let's take a minute then. Uh, you guys keep the questions coming if you have them. Let's talk about the, the HELOC that we have now for investment properties. Uh, for those of you that joined us a little bit late, um, and we'll be publishing this through the community. You're going to get some emails too in the next week or so, blasting out to everybody. Um, after I, probably 12 years, we have not had internally, we have not offered second lien HELOCs uh, and especially not for investment properties. And uh, effective about two days ago, we now are going to be offering second lien HELOCs for investment properties. Very excited about this. Let me kind of give you an idea of what we're looking at. 
um, you guys can expect 85% is the maximum CLTV, combined loan to value. So what you wanna do with that information is, is you wanna take whatever the uh, uh, estimated value is times 85%, okay? And then back out whatever your first lien mortgage is. So let's just do an easy, for easy math, let's say the value of the home is 100,000 times 85% is 85,000. Let's say you owe 50,000 on it. There is 35,000 there, differential between the two, minus closing costs, that's gonna be your, your second lien credit limit, okay? So 85% combined loan to value for non-owner occupied. If you go all the way to 85%, and let's just give you, Sorry, guys, I didn't have a chance to review this before our, our, our meeting here. Um, so you're going to be looking at somewhere. Second lien, 25, 35 to 20. Um, 8.5 is roughly what you can expect in an interest rate, assuming 780 or, cre or higher credit scores. Um, I don't see here if it differentiates between single family and two to four unit. So since it's not on my page, I'm going to assume that it, it, it won't. It's just, it's residential, single family up to four units. Let me see if there's any fine print here. Um, you know, something else I might have to quantify. This may be very interesting. And, and Marta, I may have you... Um, speak on this if you if you know the answer. So if you were to use this product for a purchase, it looks like we could do a piggyback, like a, a first second combo where maybe we do a 25, excuse me, a 75% LTV um, on a first lien and then a 10% second. So we've eliminated any need for PMI, right? Anything over 80% loan to value on a conventional basis mortgage is gonna have PMI. So this might be a way to leverage that extra to 85% loan to value where we take a first lien at 75 and then we add a 10% second. Um, Marta, my question would be, I think the CLTV to 85 is fine under conventional terms, isn't it? Because they'll let us go 85 first lien. Uh, you're talking owner occupied or non-owner occupied? Non-owner occupied. I think you can go up to 90 CLTV, but let me check. Okay. I told you that's the brains behind behind everything that goes on here. Marta's, Marta's the one that keeps us honest. Um, so for new acquisitions and assuming that we're talking about a conventional guideline, we can now get a first second combo up to at least from the second lien perspective, 85%. Marta's gonna confirm if we can actually go to 90. I don't know if this lets me go to 90. It, it actually simulates as if I could, but We'll wait for, for Mar to answer that. So um, higher leverage, no PMI, 85. Yeah, okay. On purchase, two to okay. four units, 75. Okay. So single family, what she's saying, guys, is that single family residents, if you wanted to leverage to 85% loan to value and not have to pay that PMI, your new options, brand new, straight off the, the presses, um, would be a, like say a 75% purchase with a 10% second lien HELOC. And there would be no PMI because we have not exceeded that 80% on the first lien. Interest rates, we're looking at, yeah, about, about eight and a half is gonna be the second lien interest rate for, for that product. Um, debt to income ratio, I think I saw that as a question. Let me open up my chat. Uh, debt to income ratio is 50%, same as, as conventional. Um, oh, you know what? There's a hit for a two unit. So we can do the, the two to four unit and there's an extra half a point to the rate if it's a two to four property. Um, loan amounts. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty straightforward. If you guys have specific scenarios that you want us to run, we can certainly do that. Um, we could do this in all states except for the following. I don't expect you guys to remember this. We'll have something that goes out via email. So you'll have all of this in one little nice um, marketable flyer. Alaska, Hawaii, Idaho, um, 
Missouri, North Dakota, New York, South Dakota, West Virginia, and Wyoming. Otherwise, it's available in, in all the states. Uh, anybody have any questions about second lien HELOC? Now we talked just about uh, first lien combo, but this is also applicable as a second lien on investment properties. So again, it was uh, the first lien would be 75% LTV, and then you can go an extra 10% on top Correct. of that. So mm -hmm. you're really only out of pocket 15%. Correct. And that's on a single family, Michael. If it's a two to four, um, if it's a combo, if, if this is being used as a purchase, if it's a two to four, it looks like the, the Fannie Freddie guideline says that the max CLTV is 75%, which is, happens to be the same as the LTV. The loan to value so I, there's not going to be any incentive for you to take a second on a two to four this conventionally speaking really only works on a single family residence for a purchase transaction now if you want to um, acquire the this might be a way to do it if you purchase the two to four unit at 75 percent ltb which is what fannie freddie allows us and then after the fact you could come to us and not during the purchase transaction but after you've closed and you're the owner you could come back and get a standalone 10% uh, HELOC on that property. Just can't do it simul with the purchase transaction. Got it. The other option, Shaley, is if they're tight on funds to close, they could do 65 first, 10% second, still keeping it at the 75. But wouldn't that still be the 25% down? Maybe I'm not understanding. If you did a 65% first and a 10% second, you're still at 75 CLTV. Right. But do we short on funds to close? I was just saying, you know, put less down on the on the first part of it and bring it back in with the second. Probably wouldn't be a benefit because you're probably going to have a higher payment on that second anyway. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you could, but yeah, I think that the if you're gonna do that, I think the way to do it would be if it's two to four unit, get the second lien after the fact. Put your 25% down and then come and get another 10% line of credit. And the nice thing too, remember on these lines of credit, um, you guys have heard me talk about this, you're never paying interest on what you're not using, right? So if you have this line of credit out there and available and second lien, a lot of people, you guys all know that we have that all-in-one first lien HELOC, which I still maintain is a, um, uh, the, the all-in-one is superior in every way, as far as I'm concerned. However, a lot of people really struggle with giving up their really low interest rates that they have or that they got last year, the year before during, during COVID. And they just, for their reasons, they do not want to give that up. This now is an option to, to tap into that equity and leave that first alone. And now you've got access to, to second lien funds up to that 80% CLTV. Interesting. Question, related question, Kaylee, about um, the first lien position. Um, are investors and or turnkey providers uh, offering the pay down on the rate? Is that a viable strategy? Does that really make sense? Has it ever made sense uh, to, you know, to pay down the interest rate? Uh, I guess with points, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, to further buy down an interest rate, so just to, to quantify, we are going to lock at what we call par rates. So we charge as a company 2% origination or $1,500, whichever is greater. And Michael, your question is, do I want to pay more points to get the rate even lower? And the answer is, it depends on the property and the day in which we're locking because interest rates daily can, can change and the secondary market and how they may be hedging for the mortgage-backed security related to investment properties is going to be different today than it will be tomorrow. So based on some of those variables, what I would suggest is that we want to look at it before we lock in and say, okay, today, based on this example, does it make sense an extra 1% in cost for what does that mean to the lower interest rate? And the math will be pretty clear. It'll tell you within in a number of months what your recapture is. The math is easy. So what we're going to be looking for is, okay, today, if I pay one additional point, what does that mean to my interest rate? And more importantly, what does that mean to my principal and interest payment? If one point is equivalent to $2,000, but the payment difference is only 20 bucks, right? That doesn't make sense. If you simply take 2,000 and divide by $20 difference, that's a hundred months. So your recapture is 8.3 years. I'm gonna say no, in that example, it does not make sense to spend that extra two grand to get the, 
the payment $20 cheaper. I would say that when you're running that math, five years or less, ideally two to three years is where I would like to see that, that recapture. And I can give you that formula again if I went too fast on that, you guys. Um, but when we're buying down points, I'm going to say running that math, ideally two, maybe three years, maybe up to five years, depending on the, the, um, uh, the outlook of the property, what you plan to do with it. Anything above five years in a recapture, I would say no, probably don't, don't buy down the points. One of the other things that I would offer on this topic is, is that points are tax deductible for an investment property. So while that is secondary, it should still be part of the discussion. Um, yeah, so per property, per day, run the numbers, and then we can see pretty clearly, you know, what is worth it and what isn't. Thank you. Yeah. What else, you guys? Anything else that you want to go over today while we're together? I've got a few more minutes. Happy to answer anything else if you guys have stuff. It doesn't have to be related to anything that we're talking about. It could be There's completely. There is stuff in chat. Yeah. So they're asking, oh. um, will the investor pay the closing costs on the second lien HELOC that you will be offering? Uh, when you say the investor, you mean the seller? I'm not sure if that was Marty's question. <clears throat> Al, what, so do you, do you look at the investor personally for your new, okay, that's not the question. Um, will the investor pay the closing costs on the second lien HELOC that you will be offering? Or does that mean, do, will we be paying for it? Well, I'm going to answer it this way. So um, if the seller is going to pay, or you guys can now negotiate, which if you're not asking, you need to be asking. Um, if in your new offering, if the seller will be contributing towards your closing costs. I think this is a good topic really quickly. Something we've covered before, but I think worth revisiting. Um, up until very recently, we have been in such a strong seller's market. You've never been able to negotiate price or seller paid closing costs. It just, I mean, in fact, you're gonna offer X and be outbid by, by Y. So there's not really been any incentive or, or room for negotiating either one of those, those topics. Um, conventionally speaking, and, and pretty much across the board, we're just going to use it as a baseline. 2% of the purchase price is what a seller can contribute to a buyer's closing costs. Okay. Um, if you can negotiate organically with the seller to go ahead and, and do that, fantastic. Do it. If you can't, if you go to the seller and let's say the purchase price is $100,000 and you say, okay, uh, Mrs. Seller, I'm going to give you $100,000, but I'd like you to credit back 2% towards my closing costs. If she says yes, you're, you're off to the races, you're good to go. If she says no, your workaround, you can kind of finance it in. You can offer, okay, fine. How about I offer $102,000 for this property? Now credit me back the 2% towards my closing costs. He or she should have no problems in doing it. They're still netting what they expected to net, and you've effectively financed in that extra 2%. The difference in your payment between a $102,000 purchase and a $100,000 purchase, the principal and interest payment difference is probably three bucks a month, but you've actually financed in two grand of your capital that you could retain or reserve for something else. So that makes sense. The key to this, probably the most important detail here, is that the appraised value must come in at the 102 or more, right? Because remember the lender, we are only going to lend off the lesser of the purchase price or the appraised value. Okay, so if you're offering 102 and the seller agrees, if that's how you have to do it, the seller agrees, I would, I would say absolutely do it, but make sure via the agents or any of your own due diligence that that value, we're going to hit that 102. Chances are it should be fine for a few thousand bucks. It's usually not going to be a problem. But if it is, then just keep in mind, you're going to have to have a follow-up conversation that says, um, or a conversation initially that says, if the value doesn't come in at the higher negotiated price, then we're going to have to back it down and, and get rid of the, the seller paid closing costs. Does that make sense to everybody? Anybody have any, any follow-up questions about that? Can you use that 2% to um, buy down points? Sure. Anything, any, any of your non-recurring closing costs. So let's say the closing cost total were 5,000 bucks, that, that 2%, 2, 2%, 2, 2,000 in my example, it's just, it, 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 it doesn't really matter where it comes from or where it goes. It's just going to be two grand that's coming off your, your cash to close. So could it be points? Yes. It's just less 
two grand that you are bringing to the table. But yes, you could you just have the seller say they're paying two grand towards closing and food pays or something instead of specifically addressing a buy down or something. Yeah, so if the, la the language, what she's saying is the language within the contract, rather than get specific that the seller is paying to buy down your points, just simply the seller is contributing 2% of the purchase price towards the buyer's closing costs. Uh, will the investor pay closing costs on the second lien HELOC that you'll be offering? Okay, that was the same one. Is the HELOC based on DTI or debt service coverage ratio? It's DTI, 50% is the max. Um, Al, do you, if you're still here, do you wanna ask your question? Do you look at the investor personally for, I think that, that answers the same question, right? So it's debt service ratio versus debt to income ratio. This is an individual qualification. So your income, your liabilities, it is not a debt service coverage ratio where we're just looking at the property loan. In fact, I don't know of a HELOC second lien, especially for investment property, that's gonna be debt service ratio. Not that, I, not that I'm aware of. If it exists and somebody finds it, bring it to me. I'd like to see it. Um, Eddie, hello, my friend. When starting investment career, at what point cost segregation might be a good strategy for investor? Uh, I don't understand the question. If you want to unmute Eddie and ask, or, or if not, you can email me and we can, we can look at it. Um, so this is a follow-up. I'm uh, I'm taking on second lien HELOC on my current investment property. Will Ridge charge me a closing cost? Yes, 2%. Hey, Charlie. Hi, Eddie. Yeah, hi. <laughs> Thank you for taking my call. Um, yeah. The question uh, I was trying to ask is, um, um, uh, as a beginner investor, so um, and when, at what point or how many property um, investors should have before considering using a cost, cost segregation for um, a tax strategy or tax purpose to minimize, um, you know, paying a lot of taxes? Yeah, um, I don't know. I'm gonna say five, six properties. I think that that um, I'm probably not the right place to, to answer that. I can I can ask some CPAs that do a lot of work with investors, but I'm gonna say five or six properties. Um, let me see if I can't get a better, more, more um, uh, detailed description or answer of what a CPA would say from a, a, a tax code perspective. Right. Uh, okay. It's a good question. I'll make a note and, and see if I can have an answer for you next week if you're here. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Anybody else? You guys have anything? Okay, I, how did I do? I, I feel like I'm, you know, I held my own. I mean, Larry wasn't here to, to hold my hand, but um, I think we got through uh, some good content. Thanks you, you guys for being great, here. You did a great job, Chaley. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Yes, you did. I agree. Thanks, you guys. Yeah. You got 100. I got 100. So when you're here next week, make sure you tell Larry that that um, I, I may be taking his job. <laughs> okay, we'll do. <laughs> Um, okay, you guys. Well, as always, we're here on standby. If you need us, you know how to reach us. Um, otherwise, we will be back at you next week, and I think we'll have enough content. We're going to dig back into how to analyze your investment properties on a you know per property basis, what to be looking for, and and some of those different definitions between cash on cash and ROI, etc. Maybe it's a refresher for some of you. Uh, maybe you'll be you know getting a few new nuggets. Um, but we'll see you same channel, same time. Bye, gang. See you next week. Goodbye. Bye.